Good afternoon. Happy belated Thanksgiving. I'm trusting that everyone had a really good, warm Thanksgiving time period and everybody's ready for the holidays as they come up. And uh, um, my name is Gail Carr Williams and I'm with Vanderbilt University and on behalf of Vanderbilt University would like to welcome you to our second installment of Food for Thought, the role of art in pop culture through the works of Norman Rockwell and 30 Americans. I want to say uh, how wonderful it is to be here with our partner, the Frist Center. It's been an absolutely great partner, and we're having just a great time. So thank you all for being here and supporting the Frist. And speaking of supporting the Frist, uh, I hope you all get an opportunity to stop in and look in the gift shop today. They have some amazing, amazing gifts, and with this being the holiday season, you probably can get a lot done this afternoon, just sort of thinking. <laughs> and also, the gift of membership is also a very good opportunity for your friends and family. As much as you enjoy the exhibit today as a gift from the Frisk, you might want to share that gift as well with others. So just thinking about that, you know, they're a great partner and they're just a great, a great, this is a great art center to have in our community, so it's a great way to support it. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our panel. We have a great panel today that I'm truly, truly excited about. Um, we're going to have a really good time talking about these two exhibits. First, I want to introduce Megan Robertson, who has been our partner in um, planning these lunch boxes. And Megan is going to be our moderator today. And also on the panel, furthest over is Professor Art Johnson from Vanderbilt University. And also on our panel, we have a, one of our very new faculty members here at Vanderbilt, Professor Rebecca Keegan Van Diver. <laughs> uh, so it's great to have her as well. And also from the Frisk Center is Katie Delmez. And um, this time we put their bios on a sheet of paper for you to be able to keep them and to be able to refresh as time goes on these absolute wonderful people who uh, are going to share their insights and their intellect about this absolutely fabulous exhibits that we have here today. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Megan and thank you all for being here and uh, happy holiday season to each and every one of you. Thanks for being here. The Frist Center would also like to extend um, just their immense gratitude to Gail Carr Williams for organizing this wonderful series and to the Office of Community, Government, and Neighborhood Relations at Vanderbilt for partnering with us on the series. So in addition to moderating, you'll hear my voice for a minute as I introduce you to American Chronicles, The Art of Norman Rockwell. This is the first large exhibition at the Frist Center devoted to a major illustrator. Rockwell is, of course, the most beloved and best-known American illustrator of all time. He created his illustrations as oil paintings, and because of the wide exposure he gained through working for magazines and advertising, he is, in effect, also the most famous American painter of the 20th century. People often ask, is Rockwell considered an illustrator or a fine artist? For us, we see him absolutely as both, with illustrators simply being a specific category of artist. Where Rockwell's work differs from much of the artwork displayed in museums is that his famous images were created specifically for a commercial interest. The 4,000 illustrations he produced accompanied fictional stories, enticed the public to buy magazines, and sold a myriad of products. They're also ingenious examples of visual storytelling, technically superb paintings, and an important part of our American visual heritage. Norman Rockwell is closely associated with the magazine The Saturday Evening Post, for which he produced 323 cover illustrations between 1916 and 1963. In the 20s, the Post reached 3 million readers, and in an era before television, these stories and illustrations were an important form of entertainment. Chalked full of realistic details, Rockwell's cover images told an entire story in a single picture. While Rockwell had the creative latitude to develop his own original concept for post covers, the magazine's editors insisted that illustrations reflect a politically conservative and idealized picture of American life. 
Rockwell supplied the Post with feel-good images of family vacations and holidays, and rites of passage for boys and girls in small-town America. Urban scenes, people of color in anything but service roles, and complicated emotions, unless a bittersweet resolution was absolutely assured, were not to be included. In the 1940s, Rockwell was called upon by the U.S. government to produce imagery promoting the war effort. His four freedoms, some of his best-known images, were inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt's 1941 State of the Union Address outlining basic human rights that must be defended across the globe, a speech that laid the groundwork for U.S. entry in the Second World War. Rockwell was moved by Roosevelt's speech and really struggled to come up with a picture concept that could convey these lofty ideals. Ultimately, he chose to outline the foundations of democracy through images of small town life. The War Office did not have time or money to produce the images when he brought his sketches for the series and with another completed commission, but Curtis Publishing, home of the Saturday Evening Post, immediately saw their value and commissioned Rockwell to complete them as illustrations for the magazine. The U.S. Treasury quickly realized their error and partnered with the Saturday Evening Post for a 16-city tour of the original oil paintings along with Rockwell himself, other celebrities, um, and an initiative to sell war bonds. But purchasers of the bonds received Rockwell's posters, and the effort raised $130 million. Norman Rockwell produced illustrations for advertisements for over 150 companies, a diverse portfolio that included Coca-Cola, Colgate toothpaste, Resbestos brake pads, seen here, Pan American Airlines, Budweiser, and Jell-O. Rockwell's ability to construct fictional realities that offered a compelling picture of the life that many 20th century Americans aspired to made him ideal for commercial advertising. In the early 1950s, the advertising executive Leo Burnett had a stroke of genius when he paired popular icons Superman, Howdy Doody, and Norman Rockwell with Battle Creek, Michigan star cereal maker Kellogg's. With an innovative color palette, contemporary design, um, the ad campaign changed the look of cereal boxes and inspired shoppers to eagerly reach for them on, their on the grocery shelves. Rockwell's images of fresh-faced kids convey the idea of health, happiness, and a big enthusiasm for Kellogg's cereal. Kellogg's chose Rockwell both for his compelling images and for public associations with Rockwell himself. Adjectives and qualities used to describe Rockwell, like wholesomeness, quality, honesty, and as American as apple pie, would rub off on the products he sold. Rockwell was himself a celebrity. Advertisers happily included his signature on illustrations and sought him out as, brand, as a brand ambassador. While photography replaced illustrations in most magazines in the 20th century, Rockwell continued to be called upon to create um, images for the Post, for other magazines, 79 other magazines in total, um, and of course by advertisers. This is one of, another of his most famous images, his triple self-portrait, and it graced the 1960 issue of The Post. The cover announces the serialization of Rockwell's autobiography, and the star artist's story and image were sure to sell issues of the struggling publication. In 1963, Norman Rockwell ended his 47-year relationship with The Post. The last chapter in his career is marked by a turn towards images that depict life in America as it was, not as the dominant culture preferred to represent itself. Rockwell began illustrating articles related to civil rights issues for the progressive magazine Look. This oil painting dramatizes the experiences of six-year-old Ruby Bridges, who participated in the integration of the New Orleans School District as she's escorted to school by federal marshals. Rockwell's experience in sensitively depicting young children and talent for distilling big ideas into personal, compelling narratives make this image a moving call for social justice and exposes the ugliness of racial prejudice. And I encourage you to visit American Chronicles to see the arc of Rockwell's long career in person. From a 1914 illustration of the Boy Scouts of America to powerful images like the problem we all live with seen here. The exhibition includes original oil paintings, um, a selection of preparatory materials, and all 323 Saturday Evening Post covers. I'll now ask my colleague Katie Delmay, curator of the 30 Americans exhibition, to tell us a bit about this equally compelling but very different show. Thank you, Megan, and good afternoon to you all. Um, as Megan mentioned, I am the curator who has been in charge of the Frist Center's presentation of 30 Americans, a compelling exhibition composed of roughly 70 objects created by many of the most important African-American artists working in the last 30 years. As the list on the screen attests, 
These artists range from well-known established figures like Robert Colescott, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Kara Walker, and Carrie Mae Weems, to rising younger stars like Rashid Johnson, Kahindi Wiley, Micheline Thomas, and the one I am going to focus on today, photographer Hank Willis Thomas. 30 Americans is noteworthy because it provides an unprecedented opportunity for a cross-generational exploration of the influence of race, gender, sexuality, class, history, and even popular culture, as we will see in Thomas's work, on both individual and collective identity. Artists have long looked to popular culture as a source of inspiration and included elements of it in their work, the most celebrated practitioner, of course, being the pop artist Andy Warhol. Here is a painting in 30 Americans by Warhol's close friend, Jean-Michel Basquiat, who was once a graffiti artist on the streets of Lower Manhattan, and this work pays homage to the jazz musician Charlie Bird Parker. And on the screen now, a more recent sculpture by Shanique Smith, that is a tribute to the late rapper Tupac Shakur. Within the larger realm of popular culture, Hank Willis Thomas looks specifically at the world of advertising and all of the socio-political implications it reflects and promotes regarding race, gender, and class. He questions the role of marketing and brand association with constructs of African-American male identity in particular and states, I think that the irony of the ideal of the black male body is interesting. It is fetishized and adored in advertising, but in reality, black men are in many ways the most feared and hated bodies of the 21st century. Before we go further, I think it is worth mentioning that Thomas, who is one of the youngest artists in the show, he was born in 1976, was raised in an environment that fostered visual, visual literacy and cultural criticism. His mother, Deb, Deborah Willis, is a noted history of African American photography. And in addition to a BFA and MFA in photography, he also has a master's degree in visual criticism. From a young age then, Thomas has been acutely aware of and interested in the power of images. In his work, Thomas often draws on widely recognized advertising campaigns, such as those for Absolute Vodka, Nike, and MasterCard. But he alters the original text, or sometimes removes it altogether, to convey his pointedly critical reinterpretation. He explains his motivation for using the, language of adver the existing language of advertising. What's great about doing something that uses advertising is that so many people have access to being, able, to being able to decode it. We are all media literate. This photograph, of course, recalls MasterCard's successful Priceless campaign, which premiered in 1997. However, instead of glorifying the card's ability to provide convenience for our purchases, Thomas uses the advertisement style and wording to reflect the literal and figurative costs sustained in a culture, our American culture, motivated by consumerism and commodification. In fact, this piece is a highly personal expression for Thomas. It was made in direct response to the murder of his first cousin, Songa Willis, who was supposedly targeted for his gold chain. Hank and Songa were extremely close, and Hank was at the funeral home when his distraught aunt and uncle were discussing the arrangements for the burial. With those conversations replaying in his head, he printed the prices of the material items that led both to his killing and the resulting funeral costs over a photograph that he took of his mourning family. And the, the text culminates in the tagline, a riff on one familiar to people around the globe, picking the perfect casket for your son, priceless. In this and other related works, Thomas notes what makes these commodities so precious that they are worth taking another person's life? In his series, Branded, from 2003, Hank Willis Thomas continues his critique of consumerism within American popular culture, specifically through the frequent exploitation of athletes to sell tickets and material goods. He removes most of his subjects' identifying traits, including their faces, 
to better examine the effects of corporate branding on stereotypes of African American men and to highlight tensions between commodity and race. In this work, Branded Head, a black male body is literally branded or scarred with the Nike swoosh logo, underscoring how sponsorship can completely dominate a professional athlete's identity. Basketball and Chain shows an athlete's ankle tethered to a basketball, giving new meaning to the expression ball and chain and demonstrating the restraint athletics can have on an individual. Indeed, the team, coach, fans, sponsors, in many ways, they own you, and there is a loss of aut autonomy for the uh, athlete. In addition, professional athletics are often celebrated as a ticket out of poverty. But these pieces suggest that aligning oneself to only this notion of success limits an individual's potential uh, limits an individual's potential, and that marketers of this concept are selling an unattainable dream. The shackling and branding in both of these images also refer to the entrapments of slavery, underscoring further Thomas's point that professional athletics are in many ways a modern form of exploitation and commodification of the black body. In 2007, Thomas began a series entitled Unbranded, in which he selected two ads that feature black bodies for every year between 1968, the year um, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were assassinated, and 2008, of course, the year that our first black president was elected. To track the visual expression of blackness in the mind of corporate America, he removed all logos and slogans leaving the images and the messages they are meant to send to speak for themselves. We don't have any selections from Unbranded in our show, but I thought a sampling of a few would give us an idea of this body of work, which is so relevant to our conversation today. And as you can see from the images on screen, what is left in these images are fairly clear-cut examples of racist, and sexist for that matter, stereotyping. About stereotyping, Thomas has said, quote, I believe that advertising success rests on its ability to reinforce generalizations about race, gender, and ethni ethnicity, which can be sometimes true and sometimes horrifying, but which at a core level are a reflection of the way a culture views itself or its aspirations. In conclu conclusion, we must note that a major difference between Hank Willis Thomas and Norman Rockwell is that Thomas, of course, is not being paid by a company to market their product. Rather, aware of the influence that advertising has on our society, he uses many of its strategies, including making images that can be read quickly and understood, mm -hmm. to express his own ideas and convictions about the position of African Americans in contemporary society. Thank you very much, Katie. So with that, we'll launch on into our panel discussion. Um, and so just reintroducing um, Dr. Rebecca Vandiver and Professor Art Johnson. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to us all to just unpack a little bit about what our notions of fine art and advertising are. So if you two wouldn't mind to just speak a little bit about these different forms of communications and what they're trying to accomplish. Rebecca, you want to take it away? Okay. Oh, well, um, I'm hesitant to try to label or define art, because I think that art can be many different things. Uh, as you mentioned uh, in the introduction of uh, the Rockwell show that, um, you know, by putting his illustrations in an art museum context, uh, we sort of are highlighting that uh, an illustrator is in fact a, an artist uh, in their own right. Um, so I think that uh, what strikes me when we think about uh, a definition of art, if we wanted to even try to do it, uh, is first and foremost um, art as an object. Um, here we're sort of consuming and viewing these objects in the museum setting uh, and sort of what does that mean to sort of see Rockwell's Saturday um, post covers installed as an art object. Mm -hmm. um, but more than anything, um, art uh, as an example of cultural production uh, and what we're looking at uh, today is two examples of different types of American cultural production uh, that can be interpreted uh, in different ways depending on the different contexts within which it's consumed. 
And oh. I just want to remind you both to please speak into your oh, microphones. Yes, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, as, as you can see from the um, bio that's on your sheet, I spent most of my uh, career actually working in ad agencies, and it's only within the past five years or so that I, I was fortunate enough to uh, join Vanderbilt and, and, uh, and to teach there. Uh, I teach a couple of different marketing courses, so my sort of take on advertising uh, and messaging and the context, its comparison to, to fine art, uh, is a little more commercial, perhaps. Uh, and I thought maybe, uh, as a point of reference here, give you, at least this is what, the way I introduce it uh, in one of my classes, uh, is to try to sort of define the word creativity and then look at it against two different dimensions. One is uh, cre creativity as it applies to, say, fine art or the artist, and then creativity as it applies to the world of advertising. I, th I think there are some differences that, that uh, um, see if I can see if I can convince you of the same thing. If you if you look at it in the the world of the artist, um, creativity is really all about the artist. It's about a subjective interpretation of the work he or she does. Um, it's it's uh, meant to uh, I think elicit different reactions. Uh, we see beauty, we see ugly, it's all a function of kind of our own uh, set of lenses in terms of what, what we see. And I've always thought that the, the purpose um, of, of creativity in sort of the art world, if you look at some of the, the purposes it has, I think some of them are reflected here in what we're seeing and what we're talking about today, uh, it might be, there might be a political message behind it, there might be a, a message of horror, there might be a message of just beauty, just an image that is a, a beautiful image, a photograph perhaps, or, or a, a painting, the Mona Lisa comes to mind. Um, or it might just be art for sort of art's sake. Uh, it's a, if it's a, a, um, a piece of art, for example, that's a, a modernist piece that uh, may mean something very particular and special to the artist, but to other people it may uh, not have the same reaction. I think if you compare that to creativity in the, in the marketing world or the advertising world, now I'd like to say that in the advertising world, what we're talking about is, is sort of creativity with a very specific purpose in mind. Uh, and that purpose uh, ultimately, ultimately is to sell something. And whether that's to sell an idea or a concept or a product or a service or whatever, that's what we're trying to get to at, at the very end. And some of the techniques that are employed, we might do it through, uh, through just informing people of the attributes or the benefits of a product. We might, be, we might do it by trying to uh, amuse people. We might do it by trying to shock people. But at the end of the day, uh, the creativity is really sort of, sort of aimed at the, the ultimate goal, which is to help a company or a brand uh, be commercially successful. So if, if they are different, um, I think they both require, now I think creativity is a common element, but I think it's applied in, 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 in two different ways. Wonderful. Well, I think maybe we should tease out a little bit about this idea of commercial success. So it might be helpful for us to think a little bit about how artists and even exhibitions market themselves. So I don't know if Rebecca or Katie would like to speak a bit about um, uh, that little intersection between art and commerce that is sometimes a bit tricky to negotiate. Do you want to start with the exhibition? <laughs> Or, I mean, so I think that uh, an artist uh, markets themselves uh, in several ways. So uh, you have artists um, who oftentimes will be associated with a dealer or a gallerist and sort of are selling their work uh, through sort of a commercial means. Um, I don't know if any of you have been following uh, the recent um, prices paid at 
Christie's and uh, Sotheby's mm -hmm. uh, these last few weeks uh, for modern art. So art being produced in 1969, I think a Warhol sold for 112 million um, most recently. Uh, so you have art being sold vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, auction houses. Uh, and so artists, um, I think that idea of marketing themselves uh, depends a lot on the artist. Um, Lois Maylou Jones, who's a subject of my monograph, uh, it did not have a gallerist, did not sell her work uh, through a gallery. So her work uh, sort of takes on um, sort of meaning and importance through its exhibition uh, in museums context in gallery shows uh, so uh, in terms of how they're selling their work uh, a lot of it has to do with the artists own sort of ideas about um, their need to sell art sort of issues of class um, play a role uh, historically uh, and uh, how quickly they can get access and get into uh, the gallery uh, system I think what's interesting about the pieces that uh, you see in 30 Americans uh, is that they all come from a family's uh, collection that they've uh, amassed over the past um, couple of years so we're seeing a sort of uh, an example of a collector's vision of what uh, contemporary African-American art looks like to uh, them. Uh, as a result of uh, these artists being uh, in a show that has been uh, as incredibly popular as 30 Americans, obviously their cachet uh, within the art world increases, right? The more people that have seen their work uh, are compelled by it, uh, encourages other museums to purchase their work, uh, to exhibit it, uh, and sort of get, garners them uh, a market niche, uh, so to speak. Yeah, I think one thing that has been touched upon that is so important to stress uh, a major difference between, an, an, say, an illustrator like Norman Rockwell and the artists that are in 30 Americans is that um, the artists in 30 Americans, they're making art largely that isn't commissioned. Right. So in order to make mm -hmm. any money, they have to sell it, you know, typically through a gallery system initially and then perhaps through a, a secondary market, unlike a Norman Rockwell who is getting his money almost up front. He's going to you know, unless he really blows it, he's going to get paid for delivering a, a product. Um, in terms of how we market our mm -hmm. exhibitions, I do think it's interesting, another um, point of um, interesting comparison with these two shows. Norman Rockwell is an exhibition that we know the name alone is what's selling mm -hmm. that show. I'm not even sure American Chronicle, you know, there's a lot that goes, that kind of pads out the Norman Rockwell name. 30 Americans was a little bit trickier because um, what what does that title mm -hmm. really tell you about the uh, what you're going to see in the exhibition? And actually, I have a, a quote here by the, the Rubels, the collectors who um, own all of the work. They say, we decided to call the exhibition 30 Americans, Americans rather than African Americans or black Americans, because nationality is a statement of fact while racial identity is a question each artist answers in his or her, or her own way, or not at all. So for us, with our marketing of this <laughs> exhibition, we thought it was wise to um, use an image that um, announced that, that the work was made by African Americans. So rather than, say, one of the Nick Cave sound suits, which could have be made by potentially someone of, of any background, we tended to use the, um, say one of the Rashid Johnson photographs of a, of a black man or the Kahindi Wiley portraits of, of a black man, which would provide a little bit more um, um, context for, for the exhibition. And of course we want to use images that are, um, that will grab you. I mean, I guess like in, in an advertising world, you want to pick images that are clear, that are easy to read, that, you know, as you're just driving down the interstate, you will quickly, you know, get, get the message. So my colleagues in, in marketing could speak more to this, but that is generally what I would say was, was our thought in, in promoting this exhibition and also trying to pick names that were um, hopefully well known in the art community, Kahindi Wiley again being particularly hot at the moment. Well, I think that that segues into an opportunity for art to maybe weigh in on how the marketability of artists becomes an asset to um, a commercial interest. And I know that um, I was not aware of this, but Rebecca actually shared that Target had commissioned Kehinde Wiley to create beach towels. 
um, for sale. I looked them up before, and now they're selling on eBay for two to three hundred dollars. So, oh the secondary market if you're looking for a beach towel from 2008. <laughs> Which I have to say, it's so clever. You know, you can kind of be these figures laying on your beach towel. It's it's brilliant. Um, so, Art, I don't know if you wanted to chime in a little bit about um, the marketability of artists. Well. Um I guess at the end of the day, as, as Rebecca pointed out, I mean, an artist, it seems to me anyway, an artist, a fine art artist, uh, puts their uh, emotion, puts their personal feelings, puts their viewpoint into art they create. Uh, and you can see some of the wonderful examples of it here in the, in the two uh, shows that we're talking about. Um, with the, the hopes, I think a, a good, a valid, very valid point was made a moment ago, is that the Rockwell um, work uh, was, was sort of paid for in advance in uh, from the point of view of, of knowing what he had to do, whereas the, some of the other work that you see here is done with the hopes of it ultimately selling, I would suspect, at some point. I mean, even, even you know, fine artists have to eat. I mean, uh, so, you know, at, at some point, that's sort of the bottom line of it. Although I do think as they become more famous and become more known, um, it, there, it eases clearly their marketability. I mean, I think the example that Rebecca used of a uh, Warhol painting selling for a hundred million dollars plus is a uh, a great example. A great example of that. You know, one other distinction that I would make uh, that I omitted when I was first talking about maybe the differences in the in the in the two uh, between uh, sort of creativity in the art world versus creativity in the in the ad world. Um, is if the, the, one of the examples that I've used in my class is, and I probably should have brought a couple of these slides, but I didn't, uh, is that uh, if you ask an artist to design a chair, what might it look like? And then I've got three slides that I show. One is a chair made of uh, very thin pieces of wrought iron or like um, uh, that are welded together. It's very interesting looking visually but I don't think any of us would want to sit on it for five minutes. Uh, if you, likewise, another uh, image of somebody designing a chair, another artist, a chair, that's beautifully done with wood and glass, and, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a stunning visual presentation, but not very practical. Uh, on the other hand, I think from an advertising point of view, if you ask, and, and I've always thought that sort of advertising creativity, the, the person engaged in it is more like a craftsman than an artist, where he or she is designing for a purpose, and so the result of one of, the, of someone there designing a chair would be a chair that is specifically designed to be not only pretty and attractive, but also functional from the point of view of it being curved and shaped and comfortable and, and, and so on. So. Um, I don't know what that adds to what I said initially, uh, other than I think there are differences in terms of, of, the, of the creativity. But I think a specific answer to your question, uh, the more famous people become, the more they are valued in the marketplace. And I think you see that in art. You, I think you see it in, in, uh, in most everything. And, and clearly some of the work that's revealed here in these exhibits, uh, particularly some of the uh, work in 30 Americans, which I'd never seen before. I'm very, pretty familiar with most of the Rockwell illustrations. Uh, but there is some, some, some stunning uh, work there that uh, clearly will lead to, I think you described some of these artists as being sort of young and new. Uh, we will hear more about them in the future by virtue of some of the work that they've done. And I'll just add a, a little, you know, turn a, an almost an opposite case with Rockwell. The Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge originated this exhibition, and they have worked very tirelessly to promote Rockwell's reputation as a fine artist, to show the depth and range of his career, you know, including those images from Look Magazine. Um, so really kind of elevating his work. He almost has to get over the extreme legibility of his work, its commercial purpose. And I see Rebecca nodding, so would you like to chime in that? Well, I was going to say, I hope that um, after uh, our session today, if you have a chance to go up to the Rockwell Show, uh, there's a piece he does uh, for Look magazine um, called Southern Justice, uh, which um, they've 
incorporated a number of his preparatory um, drawings uh, from it, but I would want you to draw your attention to a typewritten note uh, that appears um, next to uh, the piece in which uh, he's communicating with the editor who eventually is going to publish the uh, image, uh, and he describes how he wants to produce a work that is unphotographic. Uh, and I think this move away from that legibility in terms of uh, his sort of stark realism uh, as a style that we might affiliate uh, sort of with his painting uh, style. I, I wondered if you could pull up uh, the, from the first slide that you did with him sitting. Um, sure. Do we have the one of him sitting doing his self-portrait? Uh, we do. Would you like the, the triple self-portrait? Self the triple self-portrait. There you go. Uh, so this was um, a cover for the Saturday Evening Post, and I think that it clearly illustrates, uh, not, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> Rockwell's um, extreme knowledge uh, of art history. So if you notice pinned up uh, in the corner as his inspiration, uh, you have um, a series of self-portraits, uh, one by the German um, artist Albrecht Dürer. Uh, we have, uh, he's wearing the striped hat uh, in the corner, uh, and then also a Rembrandt, uh, and then a Van Gogh. So Rockwell in this image is clearly inserting himself into an art historical legacy mm -hmm. and trajectory, even though this object uh, or this image is being reproduced uh, on the cover. Uh, and so I think that that leads to an interesting question about the intersections between uh, quote unquote fine art uh, and advertising, not necessarily in terms of uh, ideas about creativity, uh, which I would be able to debate with you, I think, at length, <laughs> uh, but more about uh, the idea of technique and strategy. Uh, and here, uh, clearly, Rockwell, uh, following sort of your standard self-portrait uh, technique, right, painting himself uh, using a mirror, uh, but also looking at someone like Hank Willis Thomas' work, uh, pulling the strategies and techniques of advertising, sort of that slickness uh, of the image uh, in a way and to sort of get his work uh, and his message uh, across. So I think that there's uh, a really compelling way in which uh, you could talk about the strategy uh, mm -hmm. of advertising, uh, particularly within the legacy of African American art history uh, and the need for representation that starts at the turn of the century uh, and sort of what compels African American artists to start producing uh, work uh, in a way that sheds uh, sort of a positive image uh, that we see uh, these contemporary African-American artists um, playing with in a new way, um, using new signs and signifiers uh, in the same way that we see uh, advertising shifting. And, yeah. and um, I think that, I'm sorry Art, to cut you off, but I think that that's a perfect segue into, we really are investigating American identity with this series. And so I think if we could maybe launch into a discussion about the relationship of how art reflects or shapes culture. So, Thomas has a very specific message he's getting across. Norman Rockwell has created iconic images um, of what American life is supposed to be to a certain group of people that perhaps 30 Americans is working to shake off some of those assumptions. So um, perhaps an art historian and an advertiser's take on how, these, how this can function, whether we're shaping or reflecting. I think advertising reflects uh, our culture, reflects what's around us. If you take a look back at um, the, many of you here would remember, as I do, some of the early TV programming, uh, the I Love Lucy's, the Ozzie and Harriet's, the, the, all those kind of uh, sitcoms that were sort of very much in a Rockwell kind of mode. I mean, they, they were what was going on in the, in the 50s uh, in, in America. And I think uh, advertisers today um, want to do the, some of the same things we talked about in fine art, is that first off it has to be noticed. And the way it gets noticed is you show, I think, an understanding to your target audience that you sort of understand where they are, you understand kind of who they are, uh, and you reflect that in the way you try to make an appeal to them. So I think, uh, it, and, and if you look even today, you, I mean, I, I, example I've used in class, if you go back four or five, six, maybe, maybe even longer than that, Super Bowls ago, you know, the big advertising uh, festival of, of uh, each February, um, what you saw was a whole body of work from lots of different companies that was, I thought, very tasteless and in very, very poor taste. Uh, you know, but it, it reflected what was going on out there with sort of young men drinking beer. That whole, that became sort of a, 
sort of a background for a lot of very tasteless, I think, kind of, kind of, kind of commercials. I think if you look t today at, 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 the, uh, at advertising, uh, it reflects the culture uh, of where we are today. I mean, I see more and more, uh, you'll see African Americans in, in, in commercials, in TV commercials, where there was a, a noted absence, uh, you know, going back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever, whenever it was. So I don't know that, that advertising drives um, uh, culture. Uh, I think it reflects culture, because I think that's by reflecting culture uh, and reflecting what's out there and making the best of it, I think that's the way you sell more stuff. My opinion. Rebecca, would you like to weigh in a little? Yeah, I think, could you put the Hendy Wiley? Absolutely. So I think that um, this idea of reflection uh, or shaping, um, I think when we're thinking about 30 Americans and thinking about the Rockwell show, I think it's important to think about the time period uh, in American history in which both of these shows are taking place. So 30 Americans, it's the last 30 years or so. Um, so very contemporary uh, production. Uh, Rockwell starting his career, I believe, in 1917, 19. Uh, actually, I think 1915 was 1915. his first commission. Okay. But I could, I could be and wrong. And finishing up, when correct. is he, he moves to look in 1963. 63, he moves to look, but and he continues working into his seven, into the 70s, okay. actually. Uh, so when you think about sort of the development of American culture and sort of the shifts that we see happening, uh, it's not surprising that we look to Rockwell's Saturday uh, evening post covers and see sort of this nostalgic mm -hmm. uh, view of sort of this Americana uh, that we associate with it. And it's interesting that he leaves the Saturday evening post in the 1960s, uh, which is right as uh, pop art emerges uh, in the United States as sort of an artistic movement uh, that is drawing explicitly from uh, sort of the inundation of mass media advertisements and sort of incorporating those um, elements into their work. Someone like Warhol, trained as a commercial illustrator, and then becomes uh, sort of his own brand, uh, an animal. Uh, and so I think that uh, you see artists in that moment in the 60s pulling in advertising uh, as a way to uh, reflect and respond to what they see happening in culture. So I think uh, when Rockwell is producing uh, these works, he's reflecting and in some ways shaping what our view is of American culture to a certain extent. Uh, and then when we get to 30 Americans, we, I think it's uh, these contemporary artists are doing both, reflecting mm -hmm. uh, contemporary uh, culture but also sort of shaping it. And I think that the Wiley uh, portrait here, uh, which is on a grand scale done uh, in a manner reminiscent of Baroque uh, portraits uh, from the 15th the 16th uh, and 17th centuries, uh, but he's posing uh, his sitters uh, who he meets on the streets uh, in their um, clothing that they wear on the street. So here we see uh, a man uh, uh, sitting astride uh, a horse uh, wearing uh, his sweatshirt with a brand clearly uh, visible on it. So I think that that sort of speaks to uh, sort of the inundation and the way in which um, sort of advertising and marketing makes its way into uh, culture and sort of determines and shapes mm -hmm. uh, sort of ideas about fashion uh, that then we see uh, Kehinde Wiley reinserting into a sort of a fine arts context here. I don't know if that responds to. I think so. I think it's a cyclical relationship, perhaps. Well, just looking at the time, we are right on track to take some audience questions at this time. Does anybody have any for our panelists? Oh, excuse me, we'll have to wait just one moment as our volunteers get the microphones ready for us. Ma'am, if you have a loud voice in the red sweatshirt, if you would like to ask us. <laughs> um, oh, I completely agree, and there's a cat at the... Um, catalog essay in the 30 Americans show refers to, I think it's called Welcome to the MBA, uh, and talking about uh, sort of the rise of the contemporary African American art star. Uh, I think that definitely uh, you are seeing blue chip 
uh, contemporary African American artists uh, in the 30 American show. That's why uh, the Rubels have collected them. Uh, and so they do carry with them their own sort of celebrity cachet. And I think you're absolutely right in determining uh, that Wiley's, uh, Wiley being approached by Target uh, to do uh, this uh, beach towel collection. He most recently uh, designed um, soccer uniforms for a European um, soccer team. Uh, and they're doing that in part because he has his own brand now as an artist. I would argue the same thing for someone like Kara Walker in her own way. She's not necessarily, uh, well, she's not necessarily taking on sort of commercial projects. Uh, another artist who's not in uh, 30 Americans, Julie Moretu, just completed um, a multi-million dollar commission for Goldman Sachs uh, in their Wall Street uh, location. Uh, so I think that uh, artists become, as they become more popular, become their own brand. Uh, and so people are uh, buying them in the same way that you might have bought a Warhol just because it was a Warhol, um, not because you're necessarily as interested uh, in the content uh, or the object uh, itself. But that's a great question because I think that's a very important distinction uh, to make as these artists uh, rise. And I do think, I definitely agree that um, Kahendi Wiley is very hot and popular and people are interested in his name, but I think it does, let's not forget that it does all begin with the image. And when you, <laughs> when you look at an image like this, it is very accessible, it's very appealing, it's something you can read quickly and easily. So I, I think that his work, ha he is so popular because, because his work yeah. is so compelling on, on many levels. Yeah. And I'll throw in, I found an interesting statistic. This is a little dated, but as of 2001, Curtis Publishing still owns the rights to about 50% of Rockwell's images, and they're still making 20 to $50 million a year on Rockwell-branded items. So yes, I think that that legibility continues to speak to people. You can see something um, easily recognizable. You know, the, the intense detail makes them seem true, and it just keeps appealing to people's sense of nostalgia. And one, one additional comment, something I thought about earlier when you were speaking art, is this whole notion when we're marketing the, the artist as celebrity, I think another distinction um, between uh, these two shows is aside from Norman Rockwell, aren't most you know, illustrators and advertisers, they're anonymous. anonymous. They're not necessarily <laughs> seeking the, the glory and the fame that most, you know, visual artists are trying to, you know, they're wanting to make a name for themselves. They want to be written about as individual artists. And, and it seems like most illustrators or, or commercial artists are not. They're more anonymous. No, I think that's very true. I, I think, um, you know, back to the, the early point that, that I think creativity in the art world is about the artist. I mean, and the becoming brands, I think, is just sort of a natural evolution of where, where famous uh, people kind of wind up. I mean, we see it in not just artists, but we see it with, uh, you know, Martha Stewart and, and everybody, uh, that other people that you can name. Uh, but I think with the, with the um, in the, in the uh, sort, of, sort of advertising world, um, you know, you, you do, it is about the brand, it is about the product, it is about the customer. It's not really about the illustrator or, or even the agency that does the work. It's about connecting a brand or a product or a service to a target audience. So I think, I think that's true. Good, we have some more questions. Just, oh, one moment, we've got a microphone coming to you. <laughs> You know, I really hadn't looked at it uh, from a, uh, a point of view of making money off them, but they could and they should because they're very, these young uh, 30 Americans, they are really the product of, shall we say, advertisement. Now, mm -hmm. when I got in there and I looked at the exhibition and I see the hair, and uh, the, there's several of uh, the pictures and, and the ex uh, portraits and what have you, the uh, presentations are of hair. Well, African Americans are very much into hair, into <laughs> ad nauseum in my mind. Uh, however, uh, these ch young people, and they're sort of like children to me because I'm so much older, uh, but they have picked it up. 
And then, like, for instance, the brand, and I know the importance of brand, and so they, they do have a brand now. I hope they make a whole lot of money about, you know, with their brands because they, they really deserve it. They're very good, excellent artists. And when I think of the photographer, I, of course, naturally think of Gordon Parks. <laughs> That's more like my time, you know? And uh, I remember the, uh, the, the uh, picture that he did of the woman, at, was it in Washington, D.C., and she had a uh, pail and a mop, mm -hmm. and uh, she was looking sad. And I remember, uh, and I'll end with this, uh, when I used to come back from Wayne State University and I'd pass um, the uh, General Motors building, and I'd see all of these women from Poland mostly, and they had their mops and they had their pails as well. And they were happy and they were not sad. They were sort of glad to have those jobs. And so I just put those two together. And thank you so much. I thought the presentation was quite interesting. Thank you very much. Well, I think your, your, your point about the hair, I think this, this idea that, that in the visual arts, the artists are both reflecting and shaping um, our culture, that they are responding to um, legitimate mm -hmm. concerns and aspects of, of our society. Ads, all, all of the artists aren't, they're, they're not immune to the ads as well, but they're hoping to maybe take it one step beyond and, and maybe shape the way a, a viewer might think about their, their surroundings as well in a new way. I think that uh, I think you're talking about Lorna Simpson's wigs piece mm -hmm. uh, that's in the show, and I think that um, that particular installation uh, is compelling also because it uh, she pairs uh, those felt. Uh, pieces, for lack of a better word, uh, or with the photographs on them, uh, with sort of textual captions, but they're sort of placed um, seemingly at random, uh, but encouraging you uh, to examine sort of the intertextual relationship, so the relationship between the image uh, and the text that we do sort of automatically when we consume uh, an advertisement. I think we were talking earlier about uh, the Warhol uh, brake pad uh, image that's up in the show. The Rockwell brake pad. Or the Rockwell um, okay. image uh, where uh, we see the mother uh, and her child that were not shown uh, the text that accompanied it. So to sort of think about how uh, that text, what, how we interpret an image when it's paired with text uh, versus um, not. Yes, so, so um, Rebecca's referring to this image, I'm thinking about my kitty, which is a, 22, a 1922 um, advertisement. So you can see the painting um, in American Chronicles. Um, but yes, it's, it's got this great kid appeal and it's pulling on your heartstrings and it's a little manipulative when you read the text. It's, I want to be ready for any emergency to stop when I have to. That's why I'm particular about the brakes on my car. So I'm a responsible mother. I use Resbestos brake pads, which just to throw in there, Resbestos, as the name implies, um, was putting their workers at grave risk um, working at, with asbestos. So yes, that, that text image relationship is, uh, is pretty compelling. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I, I show uh, in, in one of my classes are, are um, ads that go back a long time ago, and, and the, 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 the point that I make is that, you know, you have to sort of view those in context. I mean, if you look at some of the ads that ran, you know, back in the 40s and 50s and 30s, uh, we were, were kind of aghast at them, that people would either say those things or imply those things or whatever. And yet they were, at the time, you know, quite acceptable and they were part of what our culture was. Uh, but every time I, I show those, I mean, the, the students just, uh, uh, and of course I've picked some pretty um, outrageous examples, but, but you look at them and you say, how could anybody do an ad that insensitive or that, um, you know, politically incorrect or that whatever it is, and yet they were all a part of what was taking place at that time. So by today's standards, they're unacceptable, but then they were, you know, a part of America at the time. So I think so. So I've just, I've just pulled up Hank Willis Thomas's Unbranded series just to look at how um, these images are pretty shocking. Um, to, to modern eyes, and yet advertising executives and magazine editors thought that they were entirely appropriate ways to sell whatever product might be sold. <laughs> in, in defense, taking the other side, in, in defense of this, what we don't know, I don't know how old many of these images are, but 
but you know, one of the things today, as you expect, not all ad agencies are, are made up of you know, middle-aged white men who, who, who select images that are inappropriate. I mean, there are very specialty, very successful specialty <laughs> ad agencies that, are, that, that specialize in either marketing to you know, African Americans or Hispanic Americans, so the, the, uh, the culprits here may not simply be uh, Madison Avenue or traditional Madison Avenue. My understanding is that these works are all, they start in the 70s, right? 68. 68, yeah, so he's pulling from 68. Yeah, I chose some of the ones that are not the more recent ones because they are, they do have that shock appeal um, looking back, you know. But again, some of these, would, to my point, wouldn't, you'd, if you tried to do them today, you'd be, right. you'd be mm -hmm. so out of step with contemporary thinking, whatever, that you'd, you'd accomplish just the opposite for your client, and that is, you know, pu pub the public would laugh at you, and that's not what you're trying to do. So we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I think that this side of the room has gotten quite a few. Do we have any? Or this gentleman here, that Jenny, that you were heading to will be great. Thank you. Um, I'm always curious about the source of your paintings, and um, did most of these paintings come from Stockbridge? Yes. Or all of them? And uh, are there other Rockwells that are owned by individuals that are spread all over the country? There, there are indeed. Um, Rockwell is um, collected. Um, I, I'd say most notably there was an exhibition at the Smithsonian Museum that was pulled from the collections of um, George Lucas and Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg. There's a, a painting um, in our galleries upstairs that's inscribed to Walt Disney. Um, so Rockwell certainly um, touched a chord for a lot of individuals and persons of means certainly are collecting his work. Um, other institutions own his work as well. And I actually... I hate to flip through my notes, but I want to. Um, I was shocked because, you know, we think of this phenomenon of Rockwell in a museum setting as being this very almost 21st century phenomenon that museums have um, included him in the canon and really want to give him serious critical attention. But actually in his lifetime, some of his works were exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Actually in 1952, the Met purchased a Rockwell painting for their permanent collection. In 47, um, two movie posters that Norman Rockwell designed, which um, a lot of people don't realize that he also made um, film posters, were shown at the Met. And in 45, he was in an exhibition in San Francisco with some titans of American art history. So Charles Birchfield, Thomas Hart Benton, John Curry, um, and John Sloan. So, you know, this isn't, this has been an ongoing thing. And yes, to your, to your point, there are many Rockwells and many collections. One but the Stockbridge question. Museum is definitely um, the major repository. Is it hard to get uh, a group of paintings like this to the Frist? Um, I am not. I work in our education department, so I actually do not get to negotiate um, the lending of exhibitions. But I will say that um, I, I know the co my colleagues at the Rockwell Museum, and they are thrilled to have their shows travel. Um, they want their work and their museum to receive greater recognition across the country and throughout the world. Um, Katie, do you want to weigh in a little? Well, I would just say um, briefly that whenever we're getting an exhibition from one lender, like the museum in Stockbridge, or even the Rubel family collection in Miami. That's always much easier logistically. In <laughs> theory, it's one truck, you know, one one mode of correspondence, you know, rather than say some of the exhibitions that we've organized that had multiple lenders. That is that's a bit a bit trickier, and it gives our registrars a, a little bit of a headache to try to, to to pull everything together. But they always do it beautifully. Uh -oh. I think that that was just someone inadvertently tripping the alarm on our, our exit door. But we are right at 1 o'clock, and I know a lot of you have jobs to get back to. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you to our panelists.